What's your name? Dave Raymond. Are you the Dave Raymond who created the Philly Fanatic? <laughs> no, different guy. Are you the Dave Raymond who is a writer and a director known for Night Hunter, Absence of War, and Sins? No, I don't even know who that is. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Are you the Dave Raymond who created Sweet Baby Ray's Barbecue Sauce? Unfortunately, no. Are you the Dave Raymond who is the author of 14 books, including Make Your Own Electric Guitar Bass, and impeccable murder and towards an operational art for cyber conflict. Obviously I am. <laughs> no, never heard of that guy either. All right, well then what's your current job and how long have you held it? Here's the thing though, I'm also not the Dave Raymond who was in my small town in Nebraska growing up, who was sort of a public drunk and occasionally in the newspaper, <laughs> created some confusion for me. And I'm also not the Dave Raymond who hosted Dance Party USA on the uh, USA Network back in the day. So I'm the guy who I, I currently work for the Texas Rangers as their play-by-play -play announcer on TV and um, just uh, generally w whatever you call it, you know, filling in on things like uh, ESPN and Fox and stuff doing random assigned games now and again. That's basically who I am. Coming up on this edition of Life Around the Seams, our guest is the Dave Raymond, who, yes, mostly broadcast baseball. But as we'll find out, this Dave Raymond's background is even more interesting than the guy who created the Philly Fanatic or the barbecue sauce guy or the book author or the drunk from Nebraska, but maybe not quite as interesting as the, brunk, the drunk from Nebraska. Uh, his story is crazy, and his story is pretty much exactly what I had in mind when I started this podcast. Dave Raymond is next on Life Around the Seams. Former Major League pitcher Jim Bountain once wrote, You spend a good piece of your life gripping a baseball, and in the end, it turns out it was the other way around all the time. Welcome to Life Around the Scenes, a podcast about baseball people who have interesting stories from between the lines, and sometimes even more interesting stories outside the lines. Here's your host, Josh Sushan. a couple of times and when I was doing my research I realized that there's a couple of times that we nearly cross paths and I want and I'm curious to find out just how close we came on a couple of different instances okay. um, but before we get started so normally I do a introduction about who this person is but I cannot do it as well as Levi Weaver did in an article that Levi wrote in The Athletic and I'm just going to just read the first paragraph because that'll set the stage it goes like this if you don't know Dave Raymond, a lot of this story is going to sound made up. A small town Nebraska kid joins the Stanford track team as a long jumper, does stand-up comedy in his spare time, then lives in his car as a squatter on campus for six months. He finally gets a broadcasting job but quits before the first game, then is later traded for a blind radio announcer, gets a break because he shares a name with the original Philly fanatic. What does he do in the offseason? write financial articles that are credited with popping the internet bubble. Next, you're going to tell me he and his wife own a nanny and tutoring business, and now he's the TV voice of the Texas Rangers. That's one heck of a paragraph. God, you know, that is, that is uh, it's funny to hear it read like that because, um, I mean, it's true, but, I, <laughs> and it does sound, that just sounds bizarre and incredibly weird, but it, I mean, at the same time, it all makes sense to me. I mean, it's sort of how it all came together, I guess. It's one little bad decision after another. <laughs> all right, well, let's start with this. Uh, it's your freshman year in high school. I don't know if you had a gu guidance counselor who said, what do you want to be when you grow up? But if there was, what would you have said as a freshman in high school? Um, I probably wouldn't have had a very good answer to that. I would have been baffled simply by the question. By the time I was a senior in high school or even a junior, I would have absolutely told you, in fact, it wouldn't, there wouldn't even be a, a debate about what I was going to be. I was going to be an attorney. Um, and probably 
like an environmental law guy, right? Um, gonna save the world legally. Um, so that was, that was without question what I was gonna do. Now we took one of those, those tests that you take, I'm trying to think what these are called now, where they ask you a handful of questions and then they tell you at the end, this is what your competence may be. And I swear to you, it was game show host was the top one. That was like the most obvious thing that you're going to be. You're a big game show host. And then um, the other one was like super technical, like, like a, a, a rocket scientist or something like that. And I'm like, right. Well, that, that seems, I think we've covered it. <laughs> right, right. right somewhere, somewhere in between there is probably where you'll fall. And indeed, I've fallen. <laughs> well, there might be a little bit of esoteric thinking when it comes to doing stand-up comedy. Mm. I love the process of stand-up comedy. They are my favorite podcasts outside of my own, of course. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, when you first went on stage at the Purple Onion in San Francisco mm -hmm. open mic, what was your material the first night and how nervous are you? <laughs> Well, um, so I started by doing the coffee house on campus and it was just a contest. And, uh, and I was dared by a couple of friends to go do it and I did. And it was awful, I mean, it was truly awful. And I really, a wise person would have just stopped and, and stepped away, but I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it another shot. And so the Purple Onion was, you know, a divey kind of place at the time they did these open mic nights and so, um, I went and did probably five minutes of material and it was very crude and it was mostly, um, you know, it was pretty blue at the time I had a, so, uh, I had the exterior, I mean, of just a really baby faced, innocent looking, simple Nebraskan, you know, I mean, I, I looked as pure as the driven snow. And so I'd put on a, you know, a, a flannel shirt. I'd just go the whole Huckleberry route and then just be as absolutely blue um, as I possibly could be. And the only, the only thing I really had was a harmonica uh, with a little blues riff and um, some lyrics to a, a, a tune called the Impensy Blues uh, that I had written uh, in, in the dorm. And it was just stupid, but it was, you know, I did it a couple of times and then I realized like I was, that wasn't going anywhere. Do you tell your friends, hey, come see me and laugh, or are you don't want your friends to be there and see you fail? Uh, that's, that's interesting because uh, I had a group of friends who uh, definitely I wanted to be there because they were funny and they loved that sort of stuff and they got it. And even if you failed, they'd be supportive, that kind of thing. And then I had another group of friends who I absolutely would never tell because they would take too much delight in the, in the train wreck and never let me live anything down. So I didn't invite them. Um, but yeah, so I had, I had very disparate kind of odd groups of friends in college. And um, uh, so I knew who to invite and who not to, but I didn't invite a ton of people. I mean, I was, I was pretty self-conscious, pretty nervous about it. It's hard. I mean, it's really, really hard. There's a difference between being funny, making people laugh and conversation, whatever, and doing stand-up comedy. It's really challenging. And those guys are incredible. I, I mean this question part rhetorically and part literally, but how do you write a joke? So I didn't know at the time. Like, I've been amazed. Like you, like Seinfeld, I think, has really opened that, um, that universe for a lot of us to understand when he, he, comedians in cars getting coffee, they talk a lot about that process. He's talked about it in some of his documentaries and shows. I, I, I didn't know or appreciate that. But I can tell you, you know, at some point you're sitting around and you're thinking, well, I have to have a set. I have to have something. So you do start to sit down to write. And with no clue, no idea how to do it, it's, um, it's daunting. So you think of what's a funny line, you know, and then you kind of work backward out of that to set it up. And, and really, if, you know, I think as we all know too from, what was, what was the, uh, the aristocrats you ever seen? The aristocrats? No. Oh. I didn't go to Stanford. No, you need, <laughs> no, no, no. This is a great documentary. Look it up later. We, you know, we all have a little extra time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Look this one up. You'll find it somewhere on Prime or Netflix or something. But the aristocrats, it's a, it's like a really famous 
joke. Everyone in the, the comedy circles has done it. And it, it is nothing more than the setup. Everybody's joke on this one is different. The whole thing is the setup. The punchline has nothing to do with it. And what you realize as you start to write these things and stuff, you, you know, I started with the punchline. Like I started with well, what's the joke? What's, what are we going to laugh at? And try to build back off of that. Really the setup is everything. That building back is the whole thing. Obviously there's timing and there's delivery, but um, it's hard, man. And, you know, and then to try and weave them together and make it all work as a cohesive little uh, set is, is just terrifically challenging. It takes a long time. And that's why when I said like, I maybe, maybe had five minutes. Um, and it was because I would stretch out that, that song. I had like five verses to it, right? It, <laughs> it ceases to be funny at some point, right? And, um, but, but you, you know, you're just trying to stretch a little bit. So uh, it's hard because you know, to tell a good joke, no, 10, 15, 20 seconds, depending on where you are in that little cadence of, or, or discussion. Uh, subject matter you're working on well it takes a lot of those to make five minutes so you just it's hard it's really really hard i don't i don't know i still don't know that i could do it well i think of this scene in the movie eight mile it's fairly early and eminem's got this notepad and he's sitting on the bus and he's just and he's just writing and then he, and he turns the notebook another way and you can just see just like the words that he's trying to create for songs and they're just all over the place and and i remember thinking Number one, is that how all musicians do it? Or B, is that how stand-up comics do it? Where you're just constantly thinking of rhymes or lyrics or jokes or scenes if you are uh, trying to write a TV show or a movie and whether it's just like this, you know, smorgasbord of, of, of notes all over the place and whether that's how it, uh, how it works. Yeah, no, I think it is. I think it is. And then even when you have something that you, you feel like you have put together and it's ready to go, um, I think you're constantly tweaking it. You're looking, you're looking at, well, what word or what, what can I add or what would make that fun? Because you'll find yourself telling it to somebody, right? Um, just kind of casually using it in your conversation. And um, you're like, oh, that one, you know, that one played a lot, a lot better there, right there. Why, why did that play better right there than when I told it a day earlier to, to somebody? And you realize like, well, maybe it was word choice. Maybe it was something in the setup, um, you know, it could be as, as simple as um, just adding a small little image or detail on somebody or something in the joke. Um, so it's, yeah, you're constantly, you're constantly reworking it. It's just, it, it is like something that never, it really, it's like a, an organism, right? A breathing organism that it just evolves constantly and you just have to stay on top of it. Keep watering it, keep trimming the, the branches and hopefully you'll have something pretty at the end. So eventually you realize I'm not going to be a stand-up comic, or at least not now. Um, tell me about the time you go to Candlestick Park and you have this epiphany of sorts. Yeah, so also probably about the time when I was trying to, you know, declare a major and figure that piece of it out. And so with a handful of buddies, I was always campaigning to go up and see a game. I just, you know, it was something I always wanted to do. Um, going to the city to hang out, go to bars and stuff. It was fine. It was great. You know, uh, doing stuff on campus, whatever. I'll be, but I was a huge baseball fan as a kid and just having a ballpark that close and a team that close was so thrilling to me. So I always wanted to go. And so we get some guys and, and we go up to a game. We're sitting out in the bleachers and I had my binoculars and whatnot. And um, just in a moment, right, where nothing's really going on, I'm looking around here in the crowd and I see at Candlestick, they had that huge complex behind the plate. I don't know, four or five stories high, at least, that you could see sitting in the stands. And there were a lot of windows and stuff. And on each level, you could see activity. You could see, like, somebody walking across and using the copier and then walking. I'm like, what in the hell are they doing? Making copies up there like it's a five o'clock, you know? And then somebody over here is at a desk doing something. You get up and they walk over to somebody else's office. I'm like, this is unbelievable. What are these people doing? And then, you know, you start thinking like, well, maybe I could do one of those things. And then I saw the booths and thought, well, of course. These guys are broadcasting the game. They're sitting there brought, talking about the game. Like, that's incredible. And I, they, they got to be getting paid. That's a, that's a job. They're probably doing that as a job. Uh, 
that, that I would like to do that. So, um, and again, I think going back to my upbringing, right in Nebraska, Western Nebraska, way, way, way out by Wyoming, really, there was nothing. I mean, it's, it's cattle ranches and, you know, cornfields. So there, there, there are a lot of things about the world that were new and exciting and confusing to me as a, as a young person. And I didn't, I mean, I would have never, it just never crossed my mind watching TV that actors got paid or that, that there were anything but their character really on TV. Like, I, you know, of course, Bob Newhart's a psychologist. I mean, I mean, that's, we all know that. What, he's a comedian? That's TV. He's doing, he's acting, he's getting paid for it. Oh, that sort of stuff really didn't sink in for me. Um, until, you know, until I got a little bit older. So anyway, I figured that out that those guys are working and I wrote them, I wrote them a letter and asked if I could, you know, meet him or talk to him or something. And I mean, just like that, uh, Ted Robinson, Hank Greenwald, uh, they invited me up to, to meet him for lunch. And I did before a game, you know, it was like a one o'clock game or something. We had lunch, chatted. They were so kind. And then sent me on the way and just said, you know, you know, here are the things you probably want to do, right? You want to do some games, get some tape, uh, send it to us. We'll critique it. And then go get a minor league job. You're not going to start here. You're not going to start with the Yankees. You got to go get a minor league job and work your way, work your way through. And so I just took it all to heart, sent them letter or uh, uh, tapes and stuff. They sent me critiques, then started looking for minor league jobs and went down that road, like just blindly, right? Without even thinking any more about it, just did what they said. It's weird. But during your final year at Stanford, you're doing this and preparing for this, but you don't have a place to live. Why not? Mm. Well, I don't have a plan either, right? I mean, I, I mean, aside from trying to get a job, and I'm realizing that as we get toward the end of my senior year, that, well, everybody's, everything's in place. I mean, it's probably been in place for a long time now, all these announcers at all these teams. And so I realized I'm not getting a job this summer, or if I am, it's going to be very last minute. And so my thinking was at the time, if it's going to be last minute, because somebody quits at the last minute, gets sick, whatever, then I want to be ready to go. And I want to be able to take that job at the drop of a hat. So in order to do that, really a lease would be pretty cumbersome. Um, furniture is straight out. I mean, I can't have a couch and a TV. What the hell am I going to do with those? If I get a job somewhere, I've got to go. I, don't, I have a Toyota Tercel. So, you know, leaving college, you're pretty minimalist at that point anyway. So I'm like, well, let's just keep it that way. And so I just found places to sleep. And then I started working at the Olive Garden and uh, I showered at the pool at, at Stanford and in the mornings. And then across the street, this town and country villa or whatever it was called, had some grocery stores and retail spots. And they had day old donuts that they would give you for a quarter. And then a banana was about a quarter. So I'd get a, a banana and a donut in the morning after my shower at the pool. Um, and then I would, uh, you know, take charge of the day. I had all the keys on campus and I'd go to KZSU, our student radio station. I would use, you know, their, their printer computers and things like that to, um, reach out to teams and people. And I would use the sports desk phone number as my voicemail. Nobody's there in the summer. So, um, hung out a lot there, worked at the Olive Garden until that didn't work out. And then, you know, just kind of bided my time at that. It took a while. Why did you have the keys to so many places on campus? Well, I only had a couple of keys. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> let's, let's face it. Um, in life, that's everything. Right? <laughs> Having the key <laughs> is everything. So, um, so as you detailed earlier, I went to Stanford and I was going to run track and I did run track for like three years and it was terrible. And I just wasn't very good. Um, I quit on several occasions. And on one of the occasions, I'll never forget my coach, Betsy Riccardi, calling me at my dorm room and telling me like, well, you can't quit. I'm like, well, I did, right? I'm done. I can't, this is embarrassing for everybody. She's like, no, 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 no. We need you. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You need me. I'm, I'm not good. I can't beat anybody. She's like, oh, but we need you at stretch time and the team meetings, you know? I was like the team dummy. I mean, and, I, and I kid you not, uh, Brooks Johnson, our, our head coach, now, he used to thump me on the head constantly and make an example out of me all the time. Um, but I was funny and we had fun. 
And she was like, we really need you just kind of for team morale to be there and just be the goof. And so like, how about this? Talk about self-esteem issues. I went back. I'm like, okay, I'll be the rodeo clown for you guys. So anyway, finally about my junior year, I decided that um, I needed to get a clue and I needed to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. So I quit track. I got into student government and um, uh, I became the uh, senior class president. And for that, now you've got keys to administrative buildings and meeting areas and things like that. I had the keys to KZSU because the guys who left for the summer just said like, you know, you can have the keys, you know, just whatever, uh, take care. Um, and so I ended up just amassing all these keys and, and then using them to, I mean, there's one horrible, horrible night. Um, we had this government building, the ASSU, and I snuck in. I thought, well, I'll just sleep on the couch there. This will be great, right? And I'll just get up before everybody comes in. But you're so paranoid the whole time that you're not getting very good sleep. And then sure enough, I'm like, I got to, you know, I, I just, I got to get up and go. It's 530 or something. I got to get. So I go into this little room and I'm changing or something. And I hear the door unlock and people coming in. I'm like, oh, God. So like I'm hiding behind a door and I'm trying to get dressed and I'm thinking, who the hell's here? What am I going to do? Eventually I walked out. It was, it was like a custodial crew. And they were very kind, a little surprised, um, but very, very kind. And let me, let me just go in peace. But I, it was just, it was a horrible existence. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's why I had the keys. So all of the prestige of Stanford and yeah. the senior class president is homeless. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very. <laughs> but he was also penniless. So, I mean, he had that going for him. Uh, I caught one time I went up to a, so I, I would also take the radio equipment. Um, on occasion, right in the middle of the summer, nobody's used anything. So I would take it, put it my Tercel, I'd go up to Candlestick and I would go sit up way up in the top deck. And I would just do the games from up there. And it was great. It sounded wonderful. They're still probably the best broadcasts I've ever done. <laughs> um, and um, but so one time I went up there really early and what did I have to do? I had a fishing pole and some tackle and whatnot in the back of my Tercel. And so in the, the, the Bay Area there, you could park you know, down a little bit south of Candlestick, very inexpensively, and then just walk up. And so I'm down there by the water and, and I'm just kind of, you know, put a, put a line in and I catch a stupid little fish. And because I'm dumb, I thought, well, I should probably save the fish. I could, this would save me some money. I could eat this fish. <laughs> so, so I put the fish uh, in the back of the tercel with the, fishing rods, everything, take the equipment, go up, I do the game. And it's fairly cool. It's San Francisco in the summer. And in fact, it's even chilly up there uh, in the upper deck. But the sun beating into the windows of the car made the car very hot. And that car stunk to high heaven for years until I finally just got rid of it. Um, cars for kids or something like that, you know? <laughs> it, it, it stunk so bad like that fish, which I threw out that night. Never ate. God, that's the stuff I'm talking about, Josh. It was just, uh, yeah, it was a journey. It was a journey, but it was fun. I mean, at the same time, I, you know, I loved it. I always had, a, I always enjoyed the adventure part of it. Yeah, the, the number of people who broadcasted games at an empty candlestick or at an empty coliseum to get tape that have mm -hmm. gone on to become broadcasters currently. I mean, John Miller did it, Ken Korak yeah. did it, you did it, there's so many others. I kind of did it in my head. I never brought the microphone with me, but I did a lot of it in my head. I did a lot of it in the, in my, in the living room and in the, in the bedroom. Um, and, and that's how you initially get a job. So um, I want to ask you about Medford, Oregon, because this is the first mm -hmm. time that our paths nearly crossed. Um, what was the year that you were hired to work for the Timberjacks in Medford, Oregon? Yeah, so that would have been 94, I believe, that I was supposed to be working as the home PA announcer and road number two. To, to trips that I could go to, right? So if I could, um, if I could get my way uh, to whatever near town team there was, then I would, I would work with a buddy of mine from college who had the job there. And we were gonna get uh, $500 a 
a month and housing. Um, and it turns out the housing was a joke. I mean, it was like uh, this guy was also a bit of a slumlord, I think, of sorts. And he put us up in this. Well, I wouldn't even move my three boxes in there. And they got really upset about that. And I continued to sleep in my car in parking lots while I was up there because my buddy's car broke down on the way up. Anyway, I'm trying to negotiate. I get up there and they're like, no, it's $500 a month for the two of you. And I thought, well, that's complete poppycock. That is not what we agreed to. And there's no way. But, you know, they're like, well, we got this kid, however many, you know, a thousand miles away from home or something. Um, he's not going anywhere. And I was like, the hell I'm not. I, I did. So I just, after about three days, my buddy still wasn't there. And this whole thing was blowing up. I told them to pound sand. I, I basically told them, I said, you know, I owe, I owe myself a little bit more than anybody who has helped me or uh, been a part of my life a little bit more than let you take advantage of us like that. I'm just not going to do it. So you can have your job. And he told me as I left, you'll never work in baseball again. I thought, well, that may be, but I gave it a good run. And I'm out of here. You know, uh, there's a lot of people that would have, that would have said, you know what? That's how you start. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, my first year in the minors was right after college, Watertown, New York. And it was a free place to stay. And it was not a slum hole. It was actually, it was, there was four of us in the two bedroom. There was four of us interns. Um, and, it, and it wasn't great, but it was fine. We got paid $25 a day. Woo. Plus all the food we could eat at the ballpark. Oh. But we only got paid... So if it was a home game, then we got paid. And if we did a road game, then we got paid. But we didn't do all the road games. So I want to say that our, that our take home at the end of the month was, let's see, we probably worked. Yeah, it was probably in the neighborhood of $500 a month, probably somewhere between $400 and $500 a month. But it was a free place to stay, and we ate a lot of greasy hamburgers. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a grind. Yeah. So I remember, so, so that was 96. I come back to Pleasanton. I'm staying with my dad, trying to find my next job in the minors. And I remember I got an interview in Medford. And so this was going into the 97 season. I can't remember if it was November or December or January, but I remember driving up one morning and interviewing with them in person and then driving right back. And I'm trying to remember for the life of me, what happened. I don't know if I got if I didn't do want to do short season or if they just forgot about me or if they were like, whatever, we don't have to worry about this until May or June. But, but based on the timeline, your, your trip to Medford would have been a couple of years before mine. A couple years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, you were probably trying to take a spot vacated by Jesse Johansson who would have been there um, and was just kind of folding the tent at that point. Cause he probably did about two or three years and then, and then shut it. So okay. that's what the job you, which, I was going up there with Jesse um, those previous years. So, yeah, okay. he would have been trying to replace one or both of us. Okay. So we nearly crossed paths there. Yeah. But then we did cross paths because you ended up with the Sonoma County Crushers in the Independent Western League. Yeah. And I don't for the life of me remember how I stumbled upon this story, but I decided that there was a guy named Tim Wallace, Pops. <laughs> yeah. And it's the summertime, and I had just started, and I'm trying to make myself useful and trying to prove that I can – write more than, than high school sports. And so I, oh, I'm going to drive up to Ronert Park and do a story on this guy, Tim Pops Wallace. And that's the first time we did meet. Golly. Yeah, that was, so what, would, would that have been 97? Seven, 90? Yeah, 97. Yep. That would have been summer 97. Yeah. He was a beauty too, Pops, right? He was incredible. I mean, he was awesome. Yeah. Really nice guy. Old. I mean, older than anyone should have been in that league. <laughs> but, but, but he was good. He was yeah. good, man. He could, he could beat up on the little kids. And, yeah. Oh, he was awesome. What a that, was, that, that was my first story that ended up across all of the different newspapers in the Alameda newspaper group, which became a and newspapers, which mm -hmm. became Bay Area News Group. Normally, my stories would just appear in the, the, the high school stories of, of the Oakland edition. And this was the first time that, that it appeared in the Tri-Valley Herald and the Hayward Daily Review and uh, the Fremont Argus. And that was a big deal. It was a <laughs> Sunday story. And I was like, wow. <laughs> This is something. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the really big key there was you navigating the, the PR arm of the Sonoma County Crushers <laughs> and getting a press pass from me. And I, if, if I had to venture a guess, I would bet you got a physical laminated press pass. I don't know. I might have given up on that by that point <laughs> as, as the quote unquote, you know, media relations or PR guy. But that's, I just remember trying to manage all that all the time. It was, it was overwhelming for a little, you know, independent league team like that. 
it was hard keeping up with all those responsibilities and trying to broadcast and do whatever else they wanted. Man. What are some of your, uh, your fondest memories of, what was it, four years with the Crushers? Yeah, four years. And I, I would say this, the, the, the all four years were um, just the greatest, man, just the greatest. I can, so many times I remember driving back from Roanoke Park into uh, San Francisco, crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, listening to the Giants game, no doubt, after whatever we had done up there, and thinking to myself, like, this is why I understand that people want bigger and better jobs, but why would I ever leave what I'm doing? This is incredible. I am in the greatest place on the planet, doing what I love in a beautiful area. This is so wonderful. I just loved everything about it. But Dick Dietz was our manager for a couple of years there. And he was just a delightful guy, former Giants catcher, uh, all-star in 1971. And a great guy. And he, he just, he taught me so much about baseball and just the life. And I so thoroughly enjoyed the time that I had with him. He just took me under his wing and was so kind. Um, and Bob Barton, a good friend of his, ended up being a coach with us for a while as well. Another former catcher. He was even briefly on the big red machine. Um, and he was just daffy and funny. We had so much fun, man. So much fun. So laid back. And Dick would tell you anything and everything about the team. But I took, you know, I didn't know what access you normally get in these types of things. And I didn't know how to respect those lines really. And so I would just barge right in to things all the time. And I loved it. They treated me, you know, very well. You know, they, were, they gently guided me around and taught me things, but, um, but Dick was the absolute best. I remember winning a title. They won a, they won a championship um, in the Western baseball league, which was really fun. And it was so meaningful for Dick Dietz. I mean, you know, you would think like all oh, these guys, what do they care? He was so moved by that. And it meant so much to him. It was like the happiest I've ever seen a person after that. Of course I was so giddy. I felt like I won the championship as the announcer, but um, those guys, the happiness that they had and the way Dick just glowed that night, he was dancing God, it was fun, man. We had a great time. So that's, I would say, you know, those moments. The fans in Roanoke Park at those games were so great. The community was so tight-knit, and we were, the stadium was really, really compact, and, you know, people could literally comment, and you'd hear it on the radio, and it's almost like, you know, the old Vince Scully stories about how he felt like he was just having a conversation with the fans, and there'd be a give and take. It was legitimately like that. It was so precious, man. I still look back on those days so fondly. The, the other minor league stops never, ever, ever came close to comparing. And the major league jobs are so wonderful for so many reasons. But boy, for the, just the intimacy and that connection to the game. And uh, those were very, very sweet days, man. Four brilliant, brilliant years. I'll never, ever forget those. I would never give them up. So with that said, why did you give it up and go to Charleston, South Carolina and uh, across the country to a, a place you probably have never been? And uh, right. Oh, yeah. What, what's the lure? Yeah. Um, you know, people started to help me understand that, that um, if you want to matriculate ultimately to the big leagues, then you're, you're going to have to, you know, show some movement along and probably get in um, a major league organization, right? As an independent league team, you have no ties to any major league team. And so it's a little harder. And so if you go into um, a farm club for a major league team, then, um, you know, you start to meet some people who will be in the organization. Uh, you'll start to understand maybe a little better how that whole machine works, which was really important, I would say, because I didn't. I really didn't understand, you know, all those relationships and the pathways that they all took and just how all that really panned out. So um, I was encouraged to go get an affiliated minor league team, uh, get a job with one of them. And so I did. I, I was fortunate. I got that job in Charleston. and. It was great too, man. I mean, what a wonderful stop that was. Um, so, and it was, it was eye-opening and, and helpful. And I think I, when I got there, I thought like, okay, yeah, I definitely do see what people are talking about. This is, this is important for me to get to know. We, the major league team, the Tampa Bay Rays, who they were affiliated with at the time, this is 99, came through after spring training to play an exhibition game at our ballpark in Charleston against the single A club, right? 
And so, I mean, my eyes were huge. I, I was overwhelmed. It was a terrible, terrible broadcast, but um, Paul Olden was one of the radio voices, was beautiful, came in and spent a lot of time with me, just helped me sort out all the multiple, you know, duplicate numbers and who these people were. I had no clue. Um, it was really, it was, it was really quite the experience. And so then I realized like, oh, there's an entire world in baseball that I don't even understand right now. I, I really need to, to dig in at that point. And so I did, you know, when you get to that age where you're like, okay, I've had a lot of fun. It might, might be time to wean myself a little bit off that sort of college mentality and start growing up a little bit. At that point, I'm probably mid to late twenties. And then you start to realize that the baseball does some strange things to people and you get traded. Yeah. Broadcaster gets traded and not just for anybody, but you get traded. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. So <laughs> the guys who owned the, the Charleston river dogs owned a number of other teams. It was called the gold clang group, but people probably more widely recognize uh, Mike Vec as the owner uh, the son of Bill Vec, famous impresario and, owner of uh, major league teams back in the day. And he was just a, he was a wild man. Um, and Mike was similarly a, a wild man. And so he had a lot of ideas that he wanted to try and just promotional stunt after promotional stunt. And so they called me just a little before the next season, the 2000 season. I said, Hey, what would you think? We got an interesting idea. How about you go to St. Paul and you work for the St. Paul saints this year? And we'll bring their announcers down here to Charleston and they'll do the River Dogs game. I'm like, okay, well, why is that a thing? What do you mean? <laughs> why would any of us do that? Why would we? They're like, well, Jim Lucas and Don Wardlow, two really good guys up in St. Paul. Um, Don's blind. He was born without eyes. It's not like he had impaired vision, he had literally no eyes. Um, they do the games up there. And, you know, the winters, the snow and the ice, just not great. Um, we think maybe they would, you know, be better off here. And you could go there and look, St. Paul Saints, big deal, a lot of publicity embedded in that Minneapolis market and yada, yada, yada. And boy, they're selling me hard on this thing. And I'm like, well, I can't. So I just, something didn't feel right, right? I didn't love this. They're like, we're going to get big publicity. This is going to be in Sports Illustrated. We're going to throw in like a wind machine and some crab cakes and all this other stuff. It's going to be wacky. Yeah, well, fine, but it's my life. You're, you're sending me to St. Paul. I just got out of the independent I, league. And that's really what I was thinking. For was a like, reason. I, I just had my eyes open down here. I want to stay in an in, in affiliated ball. And so like, well, just think about it. Think about it. You know, let's, let's talk about this. And so I remember asking, I was like, well, to, you know, not for nothing. Let's say that I really didn't want to do it. I don't get the sense that you're really asking my permission. You're just sort of warning me because you're, you're going to do what you want to do. And I'm like, well, let's try not to think of it that way. <laughs> you know, think about it. And let's talk like tomorrow. And I remember thinking like, no, I'm not, you know, I mean, I guess I have to do it. But if I can come up with anything else, I'm going to. And there were some openings at AAA that year. And I think one of them was in Tucson and I missed it. I just didn't, you know, I didn't get it. Brett Dolan got it. And, um, but he left as the number two guy in Iowa with the Iowa Cubs. And so I called the Iowa Cubs. I said, Hey, I see Brett's leaving. Um, like you plan on to fill it. And they're like, you know, I'm telling you, it might've been a 30 minute conversation. Oh, you're from Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, okay. And your family here, whatever there. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, you can have the job. <laughs> I'm like, Really? <laughs> that simple? Sure. Yeah, that, whatever. You know, great. And I thought, well, this is awesome. And I also thought, like, they don't really care. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't either, right? I didn't care if they didn't care. I always felt that way. Like, I don't have to be your first choice. I just have to be your final choice. I, if you want three other guys and they spurn you, and then on the fourth selection and I get the job, okie doke. I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you love me or not. I, I want to work there. So, um, so yeah, so I took the job and never did report to, to St. Paul. Man, there was 200 people who applied for my job in Albuquerque. That's, oh, what, our, yeah. that's what our GM told me. John Traube said there was 200 people who applied for the job. And I remember thinking, wow, that, that makes me feel really good. Yeah. You just picked up the phone and got the job. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, timing is everything, as you know. That's Jack. right. Yes. Because so, 
Tucson took so long making their decision. They hired Brett. I mean, it was, pro it was, it might've been a couple weeks, maybe before opening day. And so Iowa was left there. It's like, well, what are you going to sort through 200 applications? Right. We haven't been taking applications. There's no job. Um, so all of a sudden that job's open and, and I knew it and I popped on it real quick because, you know, I didn't even think Tucson had announced it. Right. But they had told me like, Hey, you're not kidding. Oh yeah. Who got it? Oh, Brett Dolan. It's like, okay, enough yeah. conversation over. Domino right yeah. Now, right. You know? <laughs> and so, um, so it was just, it was just really fortunate timing, but you're right. Most of those jobs get 200 plus applications and it's like, I mean, what a, you know, you just never know how or why you're going to sneak through and get anybody's attention. Yeah. And, and actually timing did help me because in the case of the isotopes, it wasn't two weeks from the start of the season, but it was close. And one of the other things that, that John Traub uh, told both me and the media was that he didn't want to take another team's broadcaster and then they were going to have to scramble at the last minute. Maybe mm -hmm. he knew about what happened in Tucson. Sure. Maybe he knew about what happened in, in, in Iowa and so he wanted someone who didn't currently have a job, which certainly helped me since I was freelancing in, yeah, <laughs> at yeah. the time. So, uh, yeah, uh, th that's one of the times when being unemployed really helped me <laughs> because yeah. he didn't want to take another team's broadcaster at the last second. So, and that circles all the way back to my original decision to not have an apartment, not get a job, not get handcuffed to something that I couldn't just leave in a moment's notice. I always wanted to have that ability. And even when I worked in minor with minor league teams, I preferred not to be there in the off season and to be freelancing, even if I'd make far less money, because if something popped up, I wanted to be completely no strings attached and be able to just bolt. And I hate, I really always disliked that, that notion about taking another team's announcer and stuff. Cause I ran into that a couple of times too, in the minor leagues. I thought, gosh, that's just, you know, they'll figure it out. Yeah. Just, Take, take the person who's prepared for the job or who you want for the job, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting you brought up um, the off season because that's what I wanted to get into. Uh, most of the people who listen to this podcast probably work in minor league baseball, but uh, for those for, like my mom um, who don't know, <laughs> um, not everyone is a full-time job, right? So I do yeah. a whole bunch of different things. Some people do sales, some people do media relations, some people do social media or, or travel or a variety of things. Um, usually it's up to... The, the team, the employer, they usually tell you, well, you're going to be seasonal only, or no, you have to work here full time. Um, was it strictly your choice or did they always tell you this is the only way you can do it is seasonal? Um, no, it, it, it fluctuated from, from job to job. Um, when I started with Sonoma County, they, um, uh, I think the idea was that I would be there year round full time. But I wasn't very good at sales. And the first, uh, the first opportunity I had there, I just didn't have that gene. And so when the first then real season ended, they called me in and they're like, you know, I think probably <laughs> just kind of working through some things here out loud. I think you might enjoy or do better not having a job here until the season starts again. Uh, well, sure. And I remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, thanks. Because I can't make any money in sales because I just, I can't figure it out. I'm not, it's, my heart's not in it, whatever. I just couldn't do it. So I was grateful for that. I'm like, absolutely, I'm out. Um, and I'll see you, whatever, in April or May. So that arrangement for me was great. Charleston let me do the same thing. And then when I went to Iowa, I did it for like a year or so, but then I got married. And so the going back and forth sort of was now becoming an issue for my wife, right? She's like, well, wait a minute. Are we married six months a year, 12 months a year? Like, what's the deal? Right? I'm like, I mean, really? Are we going to, I mean, I guess we're going to have to make this choice then, right? And go full bore into baseball. I mean, so we tried to avoid it for a while, but ultimately then we started going in full time year round with the baseball team so we could be together and be a family. Um, but that left me, you know what I did four years, five, I probably did seven years of the back and forth prior to getting married and doing it one year as a married man and then, and then succumbing to, uh, you know, being there year round with the team. 
I want to ask you about Forbes magazine in a moment, but first, what were some of the other off season jobs that you had? That was awesome. So, um, <laughs> well, uh, what I took some temp jobs. I went to a temp agency and took some temp jobs and I loved it. And my idea was at the time I was single and young and living in the Bay area. And so what you realize at some point is like, okay, well, I'm not in college and I don't have a full-time job. I'm really just kind of a grifter. And so like, how am I meeting people, or, you know, women? And so I wasn't. And so I thought, well, if I do this temp thing and take jobs and reception and things like that, maybe I'll meet some people at these places and uh, who knows. And so that was kind of cool. So it was, it was kind of a, it had a, a dual purpose to it and it worked out great. And then um, one of the, I, so I, I, I did something at Netscape for a while. And then I went to, I ended up at Sun Microsystems and that turned into almost a full-time job, like a full summer job, right? And I remember when it was time to leave, they had just invented this thing called Java and JavaScript they were pretty excited about. And um, I was filing contracts uh, alphabetically, which turns out is how people file most things. And um, so I'm filing contracts all day, every day. And the time comes where it's time for me to go back to baseball. And they're like, what? You're not going to just stay here? You know, you're making whatever it was, like 15 bucks an hour or something stupid, right? I'm like, this is unbelievable. I'm like, well, how are you full time? You want to be here full time? I'm like, well, no, not even a little bit, but thank you. Um, so I left. And um, then the next year, I got a job at the Stanford Athletic Department. Um, uh, filling in for Bob Vasquez, a dear friend who was going through some health issues at the time. And he was the basketball SID. Um, so I was doing his job for, I don't know what it was, five, six months. And while I was there, a buddy of mine from college who was a wrestling coach came and said, Hey, I've got this buddy at Forbes. They need a fact checker. I had no idea what it was. I said, well, I'll give it a shot. He's like, you should call him. You should call him. And again, 10 minutes into the conversation, oh, I'll be here tomorrow. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> I was like, okie doke. So, uh, you know, I show up, you underline the facts in a story and then you confirm that they're facts. Well, this was great. And then I started writing articles and then that's how um, that whole thing kind of came together. But it was just random. Yeah, because when I, when I was researching this, I'm thinking if, if, if Forbes magazine has a job opening and they post it and someone applies for it and says, yeah, I do minor league baseball play by play. I don't think that they would look at the resume for more than a few seconds before going on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no doubt. No doubt. But, but the, but the end was being a fact checker and they just wanted somebody who, you know, and you want somebody who's going to be responsible and do a nice job there, but let's face it. That's not, that's no big deal. So I got in and I'm just fact checking and I did it for a while, but it was a small office. And so um, it was probably a little Burlingame officer, probably about six, seven people there. And so I kind of became pretty familiar with everything they were doing. And um, I can't remember what the issue was that they were working on, but <laughs> I just tried my hand at something, right? I just thought, well, I'll write a story for them. I'm the fact checker. I'm the hourly fact checker who's here four hours a day. Um, surely they'll enjoy this. So I wrote this article and this editor took me aside like the next day and was like, this is garbage and circled all this stuff. She's like, this is terrible. You can't do that. You never, we never do this when we're reporting. You never do that. And, you know, just gave me like a two year tutorial in about an hour. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, she's like, but in our next issue, we're going to, it's going to be on failure. And I want you to do this story, right? Um, epic failures in Silicon Valley history or whatever. And uh, so, okay, that'd be cool. So she's like, research this, call these people, do these things. And so I did. And then they took my article and, and then I just became like a swing man. You know, I was a, uh, I was a power forward and a point guard and a post all at the same time. I, I was able to do everything they needed. So uh, just a little Swiss army knife that would give me cruddy little stories. But then, sorry to just blather on, the, um, I, I had a, a, a kind of an affinity, especially during the fact checking came out, like I understood the numbers and the financials and how all those things work and the relationships. And so when I go fact check stuff, I would go back and look to the documents filed with the SEC and whatnot. And then 
I would find irregularities and things and point it out. And they're like, wait a minute, what? What are you saying? I'm like, well, look, they did this and then they were doing that, but they said this and that's illegal. And they're like, wait a minute, hold that thought, right? Work on that a little bit more. And so then I started doing, they just started putting me on those. They're like, just find more of that stuff. Do, do that. So I would just poke around financials all the time with companies and find little oddball things going on. In, in layman's terms, what would be an ir- irregularity that you would find? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I don't know if this is so much an irregularity, but there was a time there. So this was probably what, late 90s, um, where Yahoo was a high flying stock, right? I mean, just uh, shoot the moon. And I was going through their financials and realized that, and this is, this is I thought, pretty weird. They were making more money in a quarterly basis by gambling on their stock than they were selling anything, licensing anything, doing anything. So if they had revenues, just say, say of like $8 billion in a quarter, like $6 billion, $5 billion, whatever it was, might have been on selling calls and puts on their stock and just playing the margin as that thing's going up and down and taking these, taking these wonderful little contracts. I thought that was fascinating. So I wrote a little, just a tiny little sidebar on it. Right? I'm like, this company is, we think it's a tech company. They're a stock company. But um, you know, then I would find things where companies were, um, you know, it's, it's about when you recognize revenue and your financials, when you're a public company, it's really pretty strict. Um, so if you do a deal, and it's closed or whatever in, let's say, the first quarter of a year, but you defer recognizing that revenue until the second quarter, um, that's illegal. You know, because you're like, we've already got all the revenue we need in the first quarter to meet our numbers. Let's just push this out a little bit. And so I was, I was noticing when they do a deal with uh, companies, like there's this one company, MicroStrategy, did a, a deal with uh, NCR, National Cash Register. And, um, they would announce a deal and then the other company, NCR, might announce their deal on a different date. And then you would look through both their financials and find out the dates of the contract. But then you would notice that as an example, MicroStrategy took that revenue, like if they signed the deal and executed the deal on April 2nd, that they recognized it on March 31st in quarter one because they were hurt in quarter one. And I remember banking that information, thinking like, well, that's completely and totally fraudulent and illegal, and they would be in big trouble if anybody knew that. Um, and so I'd mark it. And then I would wait till the next quarter to see what sort of nonsense they did. And sure enough, they would do more. And I'm like, okay, now I have, you know, one time you could see a company getting away with saying like, oh, God, you, you oh, that is so dumb. We did, that was an aggressive, we'll pay a fine. That was so stupid, dumb us, right? Oh, just a couple of days difference. But you start doing it quarter after quarter, then there's a pattern here and you're in trouble. And so, um, so I wrote a little article about that and that blew up that company and, and just timing wise happened to be right there at that 2000, like March of 2000 when everything started to crumble. Yeah. And the Washington Post and others credited that story and others with basically causing the internet bubble to burst. You won the prestigious, is it pronounced Loeb? L-O-E-B? Loeb Award? Yeah, Loeb Award. I was nominated. I didn't, I didn't win it. You I didn't win it. Okay. No. no. I, I'm also yeah. struck by just the juxtaposition of working in minor league baseball where the margins are so thin, you're making so little. As a salesperson, you're trying to close a $5,000 deal, maybe 10000 If you can close 20000 it's a huge deal for a minor league team. And then in the offseason, you're looking at these reports where we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. And, and not for nothing, but like Forbes, you know, they were just having me as a contract guy or whatever. They'd pay me, I'm sure, very low for – their industry, but it was like, it was like two and three or four times what I could make, you know, in the minor leagues. And so if I would work, you know, four or five, six months there, and then I could just coast, it didn't, didn't matter. And it freed me up then to take low paying jobs or jobs that, you know, didn't maybe have much promise for me because I knew that I would be, be able to make the money on the back end to, you know, survive and, and, and that's why I didn't want to, I was really uh, anxious about giving that up 
and going full time minor league baseball. But I yeah. probably needed to, right? I mean, I probably needed to a little bit. Um, every year when I left Forbes, I have a bunch of autographed bats because they would throw a party. They would all autograph these bats, and they're like, and they were stunned every year that I left to go back to the. They're like, really? You're going back? Where are you going? Des Moines, <laughs> uh, Charleston? What? Why? It's like, because that's what I do, you know. And and they're like, but no, you do this too, right? You do this too. I said, yeah, I know. In the off season, and it's great, and I love it, and I look forward to seeing you in six months, but. Um, they were absolutely blown away every year when I left and, and every year was never a question for me. I, I enjoyed it just fine, but I never wanted to do it. 2003, the Giants had an opening for their broadcast booth, but they decided not to fill it with one person. And 2003 would have been the second time that our paths crossed. That was my final year covering the Giants for the Oakland Tribune. And so they had yourself and a variety uh, of others um, who – all did a number of games. Tell us about that process of Bay Area, Giants, John Miller, Dwayne Kuyper, and all these guys, and now you got an opportunity to do some games with them. Yeah, it was awesome, man, because growing up in Nebraska, I didn't have a team, and so I didn't have a, a regular daily broadcast to be tuned into. But when I came out to California, I latched onto the Giants, and uh, these guys were immense. They were greats. And I loved them. They're so, and it just so happens that they happen to be the best in the industry, right, at broadcasting games. So, so I was so spoiled. Um, and I just loved them so much. Uh, but a year or two prior, Ted Robinson, at the very last minute, took a job at the New York Mets. And I applied. They threw my stuff in there. I was down there at Larry Bear's doorstep like 10 minutes later. And, um, you know, I gave it a shot. But I – didn't really expect to get it. I, I was definitely not ready. Um, and so then I hear on the radio, I remember hearing on the radio um, that they hired Joe Angel and I want to say um, Tim McCarver to do some games. Yeah, that sounds I hear, right. I hear an interview with Tim McCarver and he is, he, he stepped in it, unfortunately for him, really badly in that interview. It was just one simple mistake. He said something about the ball, you know, call, they were asking about calling games there or something. He's like, oh, you know, it's such an exciting place and blah, 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 blah. And it's so, so much fun to watch, uh, you know, I mean, with that ballpark and, you know, uh, it's such a great hitter's park, you know, and bonds and all this other stuff. And I'm like, hitter's park? Why is he smoking? <laughs> and, and I remember, like, almost driving off the road. And they hung up. They, they, they got, they ended that interview quickly. Ralph Barbieri and Tom Tolbert ended that interview quickly. And, um, and then just were like, oh, I, like they didn't hide it, right? Like, oh, God, that's so awkward. Oh, boy, I feel so stupid here. We just put that guy in this position. And I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's dead before he ever got here. And so anyway, like later that day, my phone rings. This is back in the day when you just had a, like a telephone in your house for people who are a little newer to this. It was tethered to the wall, for Christ's sake. It was so primitive. But um <laughs> But those long cords that allow you to go from one room all the way across the hallway. <laughs> and would tangle up. And yes. I, I, so my phone rings and I answer it and it's like, you know, I'm like, hello, I'm an idiot. And at the other end, I hear Dave, John Miller calling San Francisco Giants. And I'm like, I, I mean, I just, I didn't know what to think or do, man. I was just stunned. I think, like, oh yeah, John, I, re I recognize the voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. He's like, yeah. So I just get my oil changed, uh, here at the, uh, let me, uh, the, the ready, uh, the, the, the Jiffy Lube. And, uh, I was listening to your tape. Uh, um, uh, Larry, Larry Barron gave it to me and told me to listen. There are a handful of guys, young guys that wanted to listen to the tapes. Uh, so I did and, uh, wanted to call you and, and, and let you know, like, that's really good. I, I, I I really like what you did here. And so he goes through and he walks me through like how I did this at bat or how I called that. And, and I won't let him go. Like he's just calling to say like, look, we're hiring somebody prepared, ready, older veteran person. But, um, you know, we should stay in touch kind of thing. And I'm like, duh, 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 hang, hang, hold on. Let's get that email real quick and the phone number. <laughs> and also it turns out I have a lot of time on my hands. It's your off season. Surely you eat. Should we eat? And he said, well, you know, uh, yeah, we could, we could eat. 
So, I mean, I, I just clinged on for dear life. And he became such an incredible friend and, and mentor. And so we would get together and talk broadcasting and baseball all the time. We still do all the time. Uh, we play Stratomatic together all the time. And he's such a wonderful dude. But so then a couple of years later, when they were then looking uh, to go a little bit younger and do some things, um, you know, I got that chance to do, to do a handful of games, all with Fleming and um, Roxy, Roxy Bernstein. Yeah, Roxy Bernstein. I yeah. forget who the fourth was, if there was a fourth. Um, gosh, McGowan? Yeah, it was McGowan. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Bruce McGowan. Bruce McGowan. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, so we all, we all got to do some games, but it was, it was one of those things that was great, wonderful experience, and I'd hoped for the best. Um, I, you know, you never know how the world's going to treat you. The games I did, uh, no offense, nothing in my innings. They were just like routine one, two, three. You know, Jason Schmidt uh, gets two ground balls and a strikeout. And Fleming's like second game, he gets a no hitter. <laughs> and he brilliantly, brilliantly handled the seventh inning, let it breathe wonderfully at the end. He just handled it so well. And I remember seeing John at my first. Um, weekend of games, Mother's Day weekend, and uh, in Atlanta, and we had lunch. And I told him, I was like, hey, "Did you did you listen to those games, the Phillies, like the Fleming?" Like, no, I haven't. I haven't heard them yet. I said, well, <laughs> go back and listen to that no hitter, and specifically listen to his seventh inning because it was awesome. He he just handled it brilliantly. It was awesome. And um, okay, yeah, yeah, I will. So he did. And um, I did my games and, you know, as the summer wore on, Dave's schedule started to expand. He started doing more games and more games. And I think, I think mine started to compress. <laughs> so, so whatever I did, whatever games I did, it was so much fun. We were in Arizona once and uh, Bonds had just come back from, I think, you know, his, his, his dad had passed and he'd missed some games. He'd had some problems physically. He comes back, he hits a home run and, he crosses the plate and he points skyward and everything. And then like an inning or so later, he's out of the game in, uh, in the clubhouse or something. None of us knew why. It's like fourth inning. I'm not doing the game. I'm just sitting in the booth with Kruk and Kite. And they, in a break, they turn around and go, hey, me, go down there and find out what happened with Bonds. I'm like, okay, uh, down where? <laughs> like, uh, down at the clubhouse. He's probably in the training room. I'm like, okay. So I'm a little bit of a greenhorn and I get that, but I don't think that we do that. And I'm like, no, 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 just go down there. You got the press pass. It's got clubhouse access, right? I'm like, oh, I guess. Yeah. Like, come on, go down there, dude. I mean, do you want this job or not? I mean, you know, this is an opportunity. You got to go get that information for us. And they knew damn good well what they were doing. <laughs> oh, sure enough. I go down there and I walk right by whatever security guards there were. I walk right into the clubhouse very quiet and I'm standing there and I'm feeling like the police are going to come grab me any second. I don't know what I'm doing. And so then I kind of tiptoe back toward the training room, pop my head in there like this. And they're like, Hey, who are you? With? I just want to see it. Barry. So what's up? And they're like, get out of here. And I run my ass out of there. And that was, um, and then I went back up to the booth and those two were so pleased with them. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> but they're the best man those guys are the greatest i had so much fun with them god those are the days yeah did it feel like a season-long uh competition from day one um from the moment that uh i get the news um it felt that way and um but john john was always really straightforward you know tried to try to spin it a little bit he's like don't please don't think of it that way there's no uh assurance anybody here is getting a job i don't think that's like joe has the job joe's the guy you guys aren't i mean just do these games and get some tape and think of it as like a chance to to spread your wings and be a big league broadcaster and he loved to do this thing when he was working with you where he would come back from an inning and he would say you know rockies four giants three john miller and dave raymond your giants broadcasters because he wanted you to use it on your demo tape. You know, he's like, now take that, put that on your demo tape. And, 
it, he did it all the time. He was, he was so cool about that sort of stuff, man. He'd try to make you look good yeah. on the radio. He was, he's brilliant. That's awesome. So uh, I'm going to slightly be patting myself on the back as I tell this story. So my, my book about Bonds' 73 homer season came out in 2002, and John wrote one of the testimonials uh, for the back. Um, and I remember it was, you know, the, must have been right before spring training started. And I'm talking to John. He's like, yeah, you know, we're trying to figure out this broadcasting thing. So that must have been right when, when Ted had left and, and they were trying to figure all this out. And, um, and I can't remember if I said something or if John said something, but I was like, yeah, I've done play by play. I did it. 20 games at Watertown, New York in the New York Penn league nine years ago. I'm ready for the majors or something like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I did 20 something games at San Diego state about a decade before that or whatever it was. And, uh, and I remember like my heart started to race and I can't remember for sure if John asked if I had a tape or if we ever got to that point. But I remember all of a sudden it hit me like, I don't have any of these. and I don't know what in the world, even if I did, like there's no way that I can have John Miller listen to these. Right. Um, and so I quickly realized this is not going to happen. But the other part about having John Miller write a testimonial for the back of your book, that's really cool. It must have been, it was, it was probably the last, and I know that it was in San Francisco. It was probably the last games in that Bay Bridge series exhibition before the regular season starts. And John has me up to the booth to talk about the book. And he pays cash for, I think, I think he paid cash for four books. Uh, so that he gave to the other uh, people in the booth or something like that. And, and of course that was cool that I got cash on the spot from John Miller. <laughs> so he has me on and then the inning is comes to an end and I figure like, okay, he's going to throw it to commercial and I'm done. And I got my plug and John just keeps talking. And he did not send it to a commercial break. He didn't tell anybody that he was right. not going to send it to a commercial break. He just kept talking to me and interviewing me. And then I did the next half inning with him. And I just remember going, oh, my God, this is incredible. I thought I was going to have two minutes with John, and I'd sneak in eight words here or there. I got an inning and a commercial break from John Miller on the radio. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and what did it do for sales? Uh, well, we did a book signing pretty shortly thereafter, and the line was enormous. Now, yeah. the overall sales were not so good because what I learned is that when you write a book about someone who was only liked in one market, <laughs> not a recipe for selling a lot of books outside of that one market. Yeah. Well, it depends, right? If it's a celebratory book or if it's uh, the knock them off the pedestal book, like love me, hate me or yeah. whatever. And, and it also comes down to when you write a season about or write a book about one season, the shelf life is about June of the next season. And mm. by then people are over what had just happened and they're on to the next things that, that Barry was yeah. doing. And then there was a Balco and there was a clear and there was a cream. <laughs> and then, and then suddenly you start looking back at some of the things you wrote and you go, yeah, I kind of wish I had that one back. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of people did, right? I mean, John, John yeah. and, and those guys were steadfast in support of Barry the whole time. Right. Right. Until, until proven guilty. Right. Then, then how could you, especially if you're a team employee, et cetera, how could you otherwise, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of people want to sit back and pass judgment on it before they know the facts. I think we all had a pretty clear idea, but we didn't have the facts. So I don't know. It's tricky, man. That's tricky. History's yeah. a, history's a B. <laughs> <laughs> so after you get, you, you get these games and you, and you get a taste of it and now you're, I guess you're back in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, describe sort of the, the conflicting emotions between I'm doing what I love. I'm happy that I'm doing this. I got a taste of it. I want more of it. And when's that full-time opportunity going to come and how long can I keep, can I keep grinding away here until that does occur? Yeah. You know, there's so many things to latch onto, I think in our industry as little lifelines, right. Just to keep you encouraged and upbeat. And um, so that one, you know, kind of gets you, if you're, if you're slowing down a little bit, then, then that opportunity in 2003 kind of pushed me a little harder. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll keep chugging. Um, didn't get the gig. And then 
something happened, I think, with the Cubs. Uh, what was it? Um, well, I think, I think Chip Carey took a job in Atlanta. Maybe got fired by Chicago. I can't remember. He took a job in Atlanta. And the TV opening was up in Chicago. And I'm with the Des Moines or Iowa Cubs, their AAA team. And I've gotten to know some people in Chicago. Uh, I thought, well, here we go. I've just done the Giants. I've got, mm, maybe this could uh, work for me here. So I tried, but I didn't have much TV. And um, I didn't really get a sniff. I mean, I don't think I got any kind of sniff at all. And so I was like, oh boy, that's not good. Um, you know what I'm trying to sell it to everybody there? Like, well, look, 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 here's my radio work. You know, I'm competent. You know, I know your organization. You know me. Um, here, here's some old TV where I can get the TV part of it figured out for you. Well, anyway, I didn't, you know, I couldn't sell it. And I didn't get anything. And I felt like, oof, that's not good, right? Because it, it, as a AAA announcer, you're hoping like, well, maybe that gives me credibility, generally speaking, around the league. But certainly, certainly it has to give me credibility with my own organization. And so when I got, when I got stiff-armed on that one, I thought, I'm in trouble, right? And I need to shake it up because I, I don't have anything with Chicago. That's pretty clear. This is not going to – that's going nowhere. And they – just hired Lynn Casper. He's not going anywhere. Um, so let me rethink this. And so I went back to kind of the San Francisco model. I'm like, well, maybe if I embed myself in a big market again, where at least you have some exposure to decision makers and stuff like that, maybe I'm just lost out here in Des Moines. So I took a job back in the independent leagues um, with the Brockton Rocks in the Boston market. And I think really unrelated, uh, the Orioles had me do like 20 games on radio that, that summer. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that I was now on the, the East Coast. At least I don't think it did. Um, I think John Miller and Joe Angel, who I got to know through that bizarre experiment in 2003, and Joe was very kind to me, very good to me, um, even as ugly as that situation was for him. Um, and they kind of got me in as a fill-in in Baltimore. So, dang, this is great, man. So I got... You know, within two years, now I'm filling in with the Orioles and I'm in the Boston market trying to maneuver a little bit there. That was going nowhere, by the way. It just didn't work. Um, but I wasn't there very long. So I, the Orioles gig gave me tapes again, which I then sent on to Houston that, that, that fall and got the Houston job. Now, the, the funny story about that is like I was stalling and confused and worried. I, I was getting mixed stuff out of Baltimore. I'm like, well, we, am I back for more games again next year or not? I kind of felt like there might've been a pseudo opening that I was being groomed for, but yet not really. It was never explicitly said. I just didn't have a real great feeling. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen there. And I'm in Brockton and quite honestly did not love going back to that kind of scene. Um, so it was tough. I had two kids and yada, yada. Um, so it's the fall. And my wife, I'm watching the World Series or something. My wife comes, uh, comes downstairs and she's like, look, you told me like in June that there was absolutely unequivocally an opening in Houston that this uh, longtime announcer there was going to take, cut back his games, no longer go on the road. But you haven't applied. Like, what the hell are we doing here in Brockton, Massachusetts, if you're not going to make the effort to go get a big league job? It's okay. Just FYI, I'm going dark. You're not going to see or hear from me for three days, right? Because that's how you, you know, making these tapes, it's kind of how you have to do it. You just got to shut the world down for three days and just plow through the garbage and see if you can find one shiny piece of metal. And so um, I work on it, get the tape together. For years, I'd apply to every job everywhere, AAA, Major League, whatever, all the time. I'd put it in the FedEx package, have 12 little weird connections and people making phone calls. Um, try and time the arrival of the letter perfectly and then call, like, watch that FedEx tracker thing. And the second it arrives, call them, hey, you know, you have something just to show up on your desk? <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And it never worked. And so I don't know what, I don't know what got into me, but I popped this tape into a manila envelope, scribbled the address on there. My letter was bizarre. Because I'd gained a lot of weight with kids, with the two kids, um, eating there. I was eating for three or four at the time. And um, 
I had some line in there, something about I'm just a fat guy on a lucky streak or something like that, you know, <laughs> talking about maybe my jobs with the Giants and the Orioles or something. And I'm just kind of a fat guy on a lucky streak and uh, hoping to you know, keep going here in Houston or something, right? <laughs> Pop it in the mail, send it off, and then kind of forget about it. That was like maybe on a Tuesday or Wednesday. On Friday, my phone rings, and it's a Houston number. And it's, I answer it, you know, it's, this is Pam Gardner uh, with the Houston Astros. So like, holy smokes. Uh, cool. Hi, Pam. And she's like, uh, we got your tape, your application and whatnot. We want, I, I mean, are you still interested in the job? I'm like, well, let me take inventory of what has happened since Tuesday. Yeah, I'm still interested in the job. Not much has changed. So yes, count me in. And she's like, well, okay, well, we're going to do some interviews here in like two weeks or something. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to come in here and do this, do that. I was just shocked. Because um, in both the Giants and Orioles case, I didn't really do an interview. It was like a referral kind of thing. So I went down there. There were like eight or nine of us who interviewed for the job. And I remember leaving. There some, you had a lunch with a guy. And then you did this big boardroom. And then the owner comes in. And I leave and a buddy of mine in Houston picks me up where we go get dinner. And he's like, how'd it go? I said, oh, I got the job. He's like, okay, no offense, but like, I don't think so. Like eight or nine dudes were here today. Um, did they tell you you got the job? No, they didn't tell me I got the job. They told me they're going to make a decision in like two weeks. He's like, you didn't get the job. I said, trust me, I got this one. <laughs> what made you so cocky? I have no idea looking back on it, but I do remember thinking like lunch went really well and the interview process in that room with all these people, I thought went really well. And um, I thought I was just myself. I was comfortable. You know, it was, it's, it's that whole thing about like kind of the attitude I had just throwing it in the mail and just letting go, not trying to manipulate the process, which I try to do every single time up to that, not try so hard with references and everything. I just, just do it in there. And then I just, I mean, I, I don't want to say I acted like I didn't care, but I was just like, if I don't get this job, whatever. Right. I mean, I've been, I've got, I've not gotten a lot of jobs. So I was just comfortable and relaxed and felt normal. And I, and I remember leaving thinking like, I've never ever talked to team personnel owners that type like that before. I've never spoken to them in those sorts of terms. Like I'm comfortable with them, like I'm a peer with them or something, right? Though I was not, um, I felt that way. And so it was the first time I'd ever left one of those types of things feeling like, I don't know, I think they saw me as an equal and I felt like I was comfortable with them. And I think it'll just, they'll give me the job. Well, they did, but um, you know, it was stupid hubris, no doubt on that night. But let me let me rewind uh, just a touch. Um, when you say <laughs> you go down into the dungeon, and and, and all broadcasters um, <clears throat> know what this. When you're trying to find an <laughs> inning that's not too long and not too short, and there's enough action, but there's not too much action, and there's not too many live reads. But I did slip in a live read here, and I told this story, and I said the score off enough, and the crowd sounded good. Um, how do you end up whittling it down when there's all of these things and you're in your own head and you're trying to feel like, well, this is the best. Is there a player on the Astros who did something in this half inning whose name I can put in there? What did you end up using for your, your demo? So I always, I, I kind of felt like I had a formula and that the formula was there should be some anecdotal contextual story bit of information, right? That, that is woven in there seamlessly enough not to be annoying yet consequential enough to be helpful for the listener. There should be a little lightness. There should be some really good, there should be a, at least one moment of really descriptive detail, whether it's where defenders are positioned or what a guy's wearing or a, a movement somebody's making. There should be some sense that you appreciate and understand that portion of the job. Um, the score has to be given enough. The context of the game, is this game one, two, three? Is this an important game? What time of year? So, like all those. So I had this checklist of stuff. 
name should probably be recognizable. There should be an exciting moment. There should be a good, de ideally, there would be um, a fluky play that is, you know, that's maybe a bit unusual that you describe that are on top of the action really well, right? So have this thing like maybe a list of like 20 things or something, you know, and if I could get a majority of those on there without, most importantly, without some sort of screw up, then that has potential. And it's got to be within a certain time frame, right? Probably about five minutes is max. So I used to hold myself to that standard all the time. So you'd listen to an inning, you'd be like, oh yeah, 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 look at this one. This, this was getting some good stuff happening here, right? And so you're listening, listening, like, oh, there's screw up, throw it out. Because I had a buddy once listen to some tapes with me and he was like, here's the deal, right? Listen to this tape and we're listening to it. And it was fine, right? But there was a mess up. He's like, let's go back to this guy making this tape. When he made this tape, he sorted through all his stuff, or at least what he had, and he tried to pick out the absolute best piece he had, the most flawless. You don't put just anything on there, you put your best. And what this guy sent us as his represented ab absolute best has a mistake in it in the first 45 seconds. How good could this guy be? Like, oh, that's a tough standard, right? It's a tough standard to live up to, but it makes a good point. So the mistake it has to be mistake free. So you sort through that stuff and it's just brutal. But when I was doing that Houston one, I was like, well, I'm not going to put minor league stuff on there. I didn't really have anything good from the Giants. I just didn't. I mean, there, there, just, there was no action in my innings. So it just wasn't great. So I was like, it's got to be something from Baltimore. So that's good because now I've simplified. I've, I've, I've shrunk the window of innings. So I'm going through and I'm listening to these things. And I just found an inning that I thought was good and that it sounded like a big league announcer doing a big league game. There was no special action. It was a Mark Burley inning. White Sox were in Baltimore. Burley was pitching. As people remember, Burley worked extremely fast. And so the inning was short. The plays were like, I remember there was a fly ball in right field. I think there was a ground ball and there might've been a strikeout. That was it. But on the fly ball, I know there was, I, there was something about maybe the sun glistening off the guy's glasses. Um, you know, just simple. It wasn't forced, right? It was just very natural. Um, uh, but at the beginning of the inning, there was something, oh, an old Hank Greenwald bit that I used to occasionally steal, which was uh, I had to read the disclaimer. So I'm like, yeah, hey, whatever. It's four to two here in the fifth inning and you know, blah, 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 blah. And so Adam Jones strikes out or something and he's walking back to the dugout and I, you know, and I was working with Joe Angel. I was like, you know, I can't, I can't read lips perfectly, Joe, but it sure looks to me like he's saying today's copyright broadcast is presented by authority of the Baltimore Orioles and Major League Baseball and any reproduction, rebroadcast, retransmission of any kind is strictly prohibited. And Joe, to his credit, thank God, he goes, that's not what he said. And I said, yeah, I don't know. That's what it looked like to me. And it was this weird exchange, right? But it was kind of funny. And it wasn't, and it didn't dominate the inning. It was just that little moment. And we move on. And so that was sprinkled in there. And I thought, you know what? That's kind of fun. That inning sounds like a big league game because there's a disclaimer. There's a little fun with it. There's some detail, whatever. It just sounded right. So I just put that on the, on the tape and, and went with it. And to this day, I don't think I've ever had, I remember I applied for a number of jobs once I was with Houston and I could never find a half inning that I liked anywhere near as much as that one, two, three inning of Mark Burley pitching and Joe and I having a little fun with the disclaimer. That, that makes me um, think about this question. Sometimes broadcasters try really hard to be funny. Sometimes mm -hmm. they are just naturally funny. Sometimes they try really hard, especially when you're working solo and you got every game or whatever. As someone who has done some stand-up comedy and someone who knows what it's like to be funny or not funny, yeah. how would you balance having fun, trying to be funny, and just naturally being funny and when to use that? So I think, I think all of it comes down to it's like everybody's funny. Everybody has funny observations and things. And, and, and I think I learned that d definitively with Twitter, right? Because when you, when you fiddle around on Twitter, you realize like, man, collectively, people have a lot of funny little comments. They're funny. 
like really clever. Um, but I think the biggest thing, I really think the biggest thing is not to ever, ever try to be funny. Um, it's just to be yourself, right? And so if you would say some smart ass thing in that moment, just say it, right? If you, if, if, if you, you know, if it doesn't feel right or maybe the moment's not there, then just don't say it. But just be comfortable. Goof around with either whomever you're with on the radio or with your listeners, right? Um, but, but you never want it to take away from the, from the game. You know, it's all those rules that we all have and we all know and we all appreciate, right? It's like, oh, yeah, don't be a distraction from the game. Yeah, don't, boy, don't insert too much of yourself in this whole thing, right? And don't try to force a story in here. We, we know all those rules. And yet, um, in an effort, a lot of times to just do the best job we can and to, to be really good at this, we do. <laughs> We're like, yeah, but if I did bring, I had this great little tidbit, if I just put it in here, I think it would be awesome. Um, and so sometimes you force it in. So I think when I, you know, when I was with Baltimore that summer, you know, the, the Giants thing didn't play out. The, the Cubs thing didn't come together. I ended up randomly getting this Baltimore opportunity. I just figured like, well, just have fun with it. You know, stop worrying, stop beating yourself up, stop putting so much pressure on yourself. Just have fun with it. Just enjoy the fact that you're in a big league ballpark broadcasting a big league game, which was always the dream. And just enjoy that and let it be whatever that is. And as a consequence, I think that inning emerged. Um, when I got to Houston, the first couple of years, I think the broadcasts were way better. My work anyway, was way better in those first couple of years than they ended up being in the back end because I started getting really focused on other jobs and coming up with the right tape, et cetera. And it's just an unhealthy way to broadcast. And you can't, you can't be funny. You might have the best joke, the best line, the best everything, but if it just doesn't come naturally in that moment, then it's just, it's just not going to work. So I, I'd say that about, you know, little stories and anecdotes and all that stuff. I prep like crazy all the time. I try not to write anything down on my score sheet or in a pad or anything like that to, you know, with the intent of getting it in the game, put the numbers, the stats in and whatnot. Um, but I really try not to, my philosophy on that has always been, if it was good enough, meaningful enough, interesting enough, then I'll remember it and regurgitate it when that opportunity just sort of presents itself and it makes sense. If I get to that game and that little anecdote about the guy scratching his initials behind the rubber because of his dad and went fishing and this and that, you know, if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. And it's not going to, no one's going to know that it didn't happen and it's not going to detract from the broadcast. So um, it's hard. I mean, I, it is so easily the most challenging part of what we do. I think technically we're all probably pretty good at handling the action and conveying the information. The challenging part is how much and when, and how do you just let yourself be you on the air? Not somebody you want to be, but just you and really being comfortable with the fact that you're, a nerd or you're a macho, watcho guy, whatever, you know, that you're a fancy boy, or whatever. You know, I always tease CJ about that, you know, because, and CJ Nikowski, my partner for most of the TV broadcasts, like he has a crazy, unique personality. He has very bizarre little quirky things. And I'll tease him about it all the time. And he just owns it, man. He just owns it. And it's great. It's what, it's what makes us, interesting people is if just own who you are and have fun. So I don't know if that, I don't know how well I'm able to answer that question, but it's just, it's just, it's so hard. It's just all about letting go and, and just being yourself. And really, I mean, that, that letting go part is the key. And that's the hardest thing for, for anyone, no matter what their occupation is, yeah. is, is, is letting go. Um, what is the stronger emotion when you finally get a full-time major league job or when you lose that first full-time major league job? Uh, getting the job, getting the job was the stronger emotion. In fact, um, so the Giants thing was huge. I remember just like losing my mind when they offered me those handful of games. The Orioles job was a big deal, but I was really in kind of a let it go mode. Um, and then when the Houston thing happened, it was really, really cool. But I remember going back to work in Brockton 
and telling everybody um, at a like a team meeting or whatever you know uh, office meeting and my boss knew right and he's set it up and said, Hey, you know, Dave has some really you know, exciting news. So I remember telling them and I couldn't get halfway through the thing without just full on blubbering tears. Right. Because it's whatever it was at that time, 15, 20 years of sacrifice and um, you know, just kind of just all in betting on yourself, all that stuff. Right. And sometimes you don't even know how much you've invested in it. Um, until it happens. And then when it happened, I, I remember just being absolutely, I mean, overwhelmed with emotion. And I think freaking out some of the younger people who had just started working at my league, well, I kind of like, holy smokes, this guy's not stable. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, 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 I remember that moment being just uh, crazy, crazy, crazy. That, that, was, that was a big one. You know, and then the, the Rangers thing kind of evolved too out of nowhere. But, um, uh, yeah, I think losing the job in Houston, I was prepared for that to happen. And I, frankly, I wanted out anyway at that point. So that was not as big a deal for me. Where and how do you and your wife get the idea of opening up a business that is for nanny and tutoring? Yeah. So uh, in this one, I'm going to, I'm, you know, we, we've talked a little while here. I think I can, I think I can be candid about this. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to, not to hide anything from you. Um, so that was December of 2014. And when I got fired by the Astros, that was whatever, the end of the season, 2012. Uh, fortunately, I ended up getting a job the next year working for Major League Baseball, uh, advanced media out in New York. It was kind of a fun job, but it was really stressful. I had no place to live again. Sleep again. On my brother's couch, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, it's just brutal. I had three kids at home and uh, yeah, yeah. And I got to pay for my transportation, making 500 bucks a day in New York, whatever, you know, I can't complain. It was awesome. I mean, they picked me up in a really bad time. So I did that that year. And then I did Fordham basketball and I did uh, Houston Texans football stuff out of Dallas. I'm traveling nonstop. I'm going crazy. I'm going to the winter meetings for major league baseball and then trying to get jobs there. And I get shingles. um, Then in December of uh, 2013, I thought it was quite honestly, I was, we were in Orlando at the baseball winter meetings and I was on call that night in case anything, any news broke and I was going to go report it for major league baseball. And so, um, I was in my room that night, not feeling well, took some Tylenol or something and started feeling worse and worse. And then started sweating and it was the middle of the night and I'm like, Oh my God, I, I, I don't think I can move. And I remember thinking, having no idea what the hell was going on with me and Pretty certain, I, I, I kid you not, pretty certain that I was going to die in that room that night in Orlando, away from my family. Like, what the, what is going on? And finally, they got a doctor up to the room and they, they steroid me up and all this stuff. And here's the thing. He's like, this dude, this doctor's like, dude, you've got shingles. You're a mess. You need to just relax, stay here, take these meds, all this other stuff. He's like, well, I've got a flight today to New York. I've got a Fordham game tomorrow night. He's like, well, you're not doing that game. And I'm telling you, I did that game white as a ghost shaking and sweating and i'm like you know oh the fordham rams we're looking forward to this one and um like it was insane and then like a day later i'm in dallas doing this texas stuff so that was a pretty that was an awakening moment in uh, december 13 so 14 comes along and i'm like i'm not going back to new york i'm not leaving my family i'm not doing this stuff and um i ended up just freelancing uh for the guys in new york but just random events, staying home and um, kind of deciding at some point that I'm done. I think, think I'm just done. Um, enough. Yeah, I've given it a run. I've had the fun. I did the things, you know, whatever. Um, by the end of the year, thinking like, that's fine to be done, but you're not really making very much money. <laughs> and um, so now you got to figure that out. And so I went searching around for franchise businesses because, of course, um, <laughs> And uh, uh, found this business and we bought it uh, December 14th, 2014, signed the papers, sent in the money. January 8th, I'm in my office in the garage, my place in the Houston area, trying to work out the numbers, figure some things out, how are we gonna do this, when are we gonna go to training, yada, yada. And I get an email from John Blake from the Rangers. Hey, you wanna do like 15 spring training games for us on TV? 
I'm like, how does he know my email address? I mean, I guess I do. I mean, yeah, we need money now if we're going to do this stupid business. So I'm like, yeah, you know, absolutely. would love to, you know. So I do those games, never hear from him. But uh, after those games, I'm like, that, that could have gone better. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, you know, took that money and started the business. And we worked for that business all that year. It was so hard. Um, and then eventually got it up on its feet. And then sure enough, John turns around and um, the White Sox actually kind of came calling. And WGN, we want to do some White Sox games. So I go up on an interview for the White Sox games. That gets back to John with the Rangers. And he's pissed at me. He's like, I was going to offer you a job like this week. I'm like, well, the timing's great. I mean, that's <laughs> so like, what is it? <laughs> so I need to, you know, let's talk because I'm also, as you now know, uh, talking to another team. So um, that's how all that came together. But that's how we bought, how and why we bought that business. And it was, I'm telling you, man, as hard as some of the things are that we've done in this business and trying to get to this business. Owning your own business, running your own business is um, a really consuming uh, gig. It's something. It's very stressful. We had to, you know, had the house, leveraged the house, you know, took a loan out on the house, all this sort of stuff. We're down to like zero and we're losing money hand over fist month after month. And I've got like no money. I had to fire our one employee. And then like the next month we turned cash flow positive and we've, you know, managed to sustain it since then. But it's, and you, and you still have the business now. Still have it. Yep. What What is the most important thing when you're looking for an Annie? Uh, reliability, honesty, reliability. Right. I mean, you want somebody who's just gonna who's gonna show up because they don't always show up. <laughs> <laughs> we've probably hired so so since that time we've probably hired. Golly, has that been six years? Let's see. Probably no less than fifteen hundred different nannies. Wow. In that time, yeah. Wow. Uh, not all of whom end up working out real well. So it's a, it's a challenging business. It sounds like most people are good into minor league baseball at the lowest levels. Um, I've taken up way more of your time than I'd planned, but let me just finish with a couple of uh, other just sort of bigger yeah. picture. Um, would you ever do another open mic stand-up comedy? I would, but not right now. And not, not until I really had some material um, put together. I've said in the past that I would never, ever do it again. But I think if I took the time and could come up with the material, it'd be a fun challenge. It would take a lot to get me there, though. It would take, take a lot. What's the non-baseball job that you miss the most? Ooh, non-baseball job that I miss? I don't know that I miss any of them. I'll <laughs> be honest with you. Work. I mean, the Olive Garden still doesn't pull you? <laughs> that one doesn't do a thing for me. <laughs> I was a warehouseman and beer delivery guy in high school, a little bit of college. Um, uh, boy. Oh, you know, no, definitely not. Hang on. I, I don't, I don't know that I really loved any job. I mean, I guess maybe the Forbes job, maybe, but I didn't feel real comfortable there either. I didn't feel like I was in my element. I've really only felt comfortable one place. <laughs> so I, you know, because there was a time, like I told you, when I bought the business, right? we're out, we're done. And I realized, like, I don't fit anywhere else. You know, so I, I can't think of a job that I would really love to go back to. When was the last time that your baseball employer made the playoffs? Hmm. Uh, never happened in Houston. Um, it happened for us while I've been here. Well, I mean, the Giants kind of in 2003. I mean, I wasn't really, I mean, only did whatever it was, a dozen games maybe, but they made it. Um, and then other than that. Um, Would it be Sonoma County? It might be. I'm trying to think if Charleston made it, and I don't think they did. Iowa, oh, Iowa made it. Iowa made it, and they did really well. They won, I don't know if they won a title. They did not, but they won a series, I think. I think they won a series. Yeah, Iowa did. So that would have been about two. That was probably 2001, maybe 2000. Okay. I checked that. That's a great question. Yeah. Because I'm wondering how you would react after all of the years of, of calling games for teams that have lost more than they've won. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No, I've got a really amazing, not only that, when I took the job in Houston, um, 
Well, when I took the job with San Francisco, right? They went to the World Series in 02. I take the job in 03. You know, took them a while to get back. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I take the job in Houston. Um, they had been to the World Series in 05. I take the job in 06. I take the job here in, in Arlington. They were the World Series in 10 and 11. I took the job, whatever it was, you know, 16. So not, not exactly immediately after, but we haven't, we've, we're hitting some, bouncing on some lows. So I have a way of catching. There's a, there, the, one of my favorites is this guy, by Sam, uh, S-A-A-M, old announcer. I think he's in the Hall of Fame. Philly's announcer, I want to say. Way, 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 way back in the early days. And no one has called as many losses as by Sam. The guy was like leaps and bounds ahead of anybody else. And so I'm, I'm always kind of figured like, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll chase by Sam. <laughs> maybe that'll be my, my legacy is I'll, I'll call as many losses as I did. All right, let me end it the way that we started it with all of the different Dave Raymonds that are out there in the world. Uh, we're going to exclude the, the town drunk Dave Raymond, but okay. if there's any other Dave Raymond who you could be, the Philly fanatic, the, the writer, director, the barbecue sauce guy, the author of books, uh, the other one that you told me at the beginning that I forgot, which other Dave Raymond would you most want to be? Uh, I would take the Philly fanatic, Dave. I've met him a few times because he was the one who really got me excited as a kid when I'd see stories about him in Sports Illustrated, you know, what he was doing with Tommy Lasorda and whatnot, and he would get his name in the article. And that always just blew my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my name, even though it's, it's not really me, but that's my name. Uh, it's like the, the jerk, uh, Steve Martin, when he gets a phone book. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I used to just, I used to think that was just amazing. And also he was brilliant. He's the best there ever has been. Um, and I just loved, I still to this day love the fanatic. So that's the guy. I mean, he's, uh, he's awesome. He's, he's, what a tremendous legacy he has too, man. And he's still doing it uh, a little bit. He has, he's started his own, you know, everybody in the minor leagues knows that. Yeah. Dave has gone on and done sport and his academies and all that stuff. So yeah, he's awesome. All right, Dave. Well, you're awesome too. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being so generous with your time. This was fun. Again, uh, your, your story is uh, so many peaks and valleys. And that was the exact point of this podcast was the unique stories of people and of, of how they got to where they got. Yeah. Well, we all have these stories, man. There's no doubt, Josh. And I, that's what, you know, it's, it's fun, man. We're all just, wacko troubadours out there doing this thing but it's it's how it's it's how it's done right we just you just go out and you do it and you pass it along and you share the stories and um it's it's delightful it's fun to talk about it with with people who appreciate and understand it and um yeah this is fun once again that was dave raymond and this is life around the scenes. 